Good evening. Welcome to the Science of Cats and Future of Nature, Nature with Jonathan Losos. Please welcome Dean Hu, Dean of Arts and Sciences, to the stage. Good evening. Can you hear me okay on the back? All right. Good evening. On behalf of Washington University Alumni Association and Arts and Sciences, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's exciting lecture with Professor Jonathan Lossos. It is wonderful to see so many alumni and friends on campus and to have so many more joining us via live stream. As Dean, I take great pride in the fact that Arts and Sciences teaches 100% of WashU undergraduates. We are the largest school on the Danforth campus and through 70 major areas of study across 44 departments and programs, we shape the journeys of thousands of students each year. Our legacy of excellence is strong, and two years ago, we announced a strategic vision, strategic vision to further elevating arts and sciences over the next decade, a roadmap for advancing our scholarship educational opportunities and impact within the, the University of Was uh, within Washington University and beyond. Already, our community has made tremendous strides towards our strategic goals. We have achieved record-breaking research funding and unprecedented cohort of exceptional new faculty and are planning and creating new state-of-the-art facilities. Truly, the decade of arts and sciences has begun, and we are delighted to have you here tonight as part of the Power of Arts and Sciences series, a program to celebrate the strength and collaborative spirit of our many disciplines and the ways in which we transform thinking, amplify new ideas, and create change makers. All events in the Power of Arts and Science series are free and open to the public as we highlight the impact of our work among a worldwide network of alumni and supporters. And I'd like to thank the, thank the WashU Alumni Association for their time and efforts in co-hosting tonight's presentation. And i also like to invite all of you to save the dates for our next two events in the Power of Arts and Sciences series. On Wednesday, March 6th, 2024, Gerald Early, Professor of English and of African and African American Studies, will speak about his new book, Play Harder, The Triumph of Black Baseball in America, written for the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. And on Tuesday, March 19th, join us for the inaugural Dean's Distinguished Lecture with Carl Phillips, Professor of English as well, and winner of the 2023 Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening. Jonathan Lossos is an internationally renowned biologist and the William H. Danforth Distinguished University Professor at WashU. His research concerns the origin and maintenance of biological diversity where do species come from, what directs the evolutionary course they take, and what ongoing ecological processes affect them today. Some of you might be surprised to know that the primary focus of the Lossos lab at Washu is not felines, but reptiles. He's known for his work exploring the behavioral and evolutionary ecology of lizards and how they evolved to adapt to changing environments. His publications and recognitions are numerous. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as the National Academy of Sciences, from which he received the prestigious Edith Medal for his published work. Born and raised in St. Louis, Jonathan earned his bachelor's degree from Harvard University and his PhD from University of California, Berkeley. He came to Washington University in 1992 for his first faculty position. While here at WashU, 
He served as the director of the Tyson Research Center and the Environmental Studies Program before heading back to Harvard in 2006 to serve as the Leonard Professor for the study of Latin America, Professor of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology and Curator of Herpetology at Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology. Jonathan then wisely returned to Washu in 2018 and was appointed as the William H. Danforth Distinguished University Professor. He also serves as the director of the Living Earth Collaborative, a groundbreaking partnership between Washington University, the St. Louis Zoo, and the Missouri Botanical Garden. The Living Earth Collaborative, now also co-directed by anthropology professor Cricket Sands, was identified as a signature initiative of the Arts and Sciences Strategic Plan, and its visionary work will establish WashU and its sister institutions in St. Louis as a global leader in the study of biodiversity, climate change, and sustainability. Alongside this important work, Jonathan has also found the time to study cats. His upper division biology course, The Science of Cats, encourages Washu seniors to take what they have learned about evolutionary biology, ecology, and behavior and apply it to, them, to one of the most popular pets in the United States. His most recent book, which has received global acclaim, is The Cat's Meow, How Cats Evolved from the savanna to your sofa. In this book, he writes from the perspective of a scientist and a cat lover, exploring how researchers are unraveling the secrets of the cats, which is one of the most popular, most successful and diverse species on the planet, as well as the most popular, one of the most popular pets. I know he's eager to share those secrets this evening, and now please join me in welcoming Professor Lossos to, to the podium. Thank you very much. That was lovely. Well, thank you, Dean Hu, for the, those very kind remarks. And thank to all of you for coming and listening to me today. And to those of you out in the ether somewhere, thanks for tuning in. Um, as Dean Hu mentioned, the, uh, my friends and colleagues, many of them, when they learn that I've written a book on cats, are surprised and befuddled uh, because I've spent my entire, year, my entire career studying lizards. And so what have, where, do these, where do the cats come from? And in fact, I have been fascinated by reptiles ever since I was a little boy. In fact, this is uh, where I went to nursery school, Ledoux Chapel on Clayton Road, which many of you may know. And here I am, five years old. <laughs> I was that kid who has a basket full of plastic dinosaurs. I knew all their names. I could pronounce their names. I knew all the facts. I was all dinosaurs all the time. Um, now, to be honest, this is not me. This is my friend Frank. <laughs> Uh, my, my wife dressed him up. It's a little disturbing that she pictures me in a bow tie at age five. But uh, nonetheless, the, the nursery school is still there. Well, a few years later, I transformed from dinosaurs to living reptiles, and it has been all lizards ever since. Nonetheless, at the same time that I was becoming fascinated with reptiles, I was also falling for cats. This is me again at age five with our first cat, Tammy who was a shelter cat adopted from the Animal Protective Association on Hanley. It's still there. Um, to, uh, <laughs> he, Tammy was a gift to my father on his birthday. Two years later, we adopted another shelter Siamese, Marisha. And ever since then, I have been gaga about cats. Nonetheless, as my education continued and then my scientific training, uh, here I am as a graduate student in Costa Rica, it never occurred to me to do anything scientifically with cats. And that was for two reasons. First is I wanted to go out into nature and observe organisms in their natural environment, seeing what they did. Anyone who has tried to follow a cat around <laughs> knows how impossible that is. As soon as the cat figures out what you're doing, which is right away, they give you the shake off into the bushes or wherever, and they're gone for several hours. So cats just didn't seem like a good study subject. 
In addition, I was under the impression that there wasn't any interesting science being done on cats. And by cats, I mean the domestic cat, not lions and tigers. Well, a few years ago, I discovered that I was absolutely wrong about that last uh, presumption. That, in fact, there is a lot of very interesting research being done on cats using all the latest cutting-edge techniques, the same methods that I use to study lizards and that my colleagues study elephants and eagles and all kinds of organisms. Things as diverse as GPS tracking, genome sequencing, isotopic analysis. It, it was all being done on cats. And then I have what I humbly submit was a brilliant idea. I would teach a cat class called the science of cats. And I would lure in students interested in cats. And then we would study uh, how scientists study biodiversity just using cats as the vehicle. And so this is the course I teach. It's being taught again in January this year, or next semester. Uh, this is from last year's class. Here in March, we went to a cat show in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Here we're meeting in Maine Coon. Uh, we also went to an, a shelter, Open Doors Animal Sanctuary. And we did lots of different things and learned all about cats. And we had a lot of fun. But as we were learning about cats, we also learned a lot about how scientists study nature. And so the class, I think, was, was quite successful. So once I taught the class, it was a natural next step to write a book to all the people out in the world who are interested in cats to, to try to tell them about how scientists, how we know what we know about cats and how scientists study nature using cats as an example. But as I got into researching this book, something unexpected happened. And that is I became enamored with cat science and began thinking of doing cat research myself. Now, uh, I study evolutionary biology, why not study the evolution of the domestic cat? Now, I'm not giving up my day job. My lab still focuses very much on lizard studies, but I've also begun to study cats myself, and I'll tell you a little bit about that towards the end of my talk. But for now, let's talk about the science of cats and what we know about them, and let's start with the title of my book, The Cat's Meow. Anyone who has lived with a cat knows that cats meow to us. They are communicating. They are trying to say something, and they do it directly to, to us. I had always assumed that cats meow to communicate with each other, and that by meowing to us, they were including us in their social circle, treating us as honorary cats, if you will. But in fact, researchers who've studied colonies of unowned outdoor cats have discovered that cats do not generally meow to each other. What they did is they went out and just watched what the cats did, just like Jane Goodall studied chimps and many other researchers do with animals, and the cats don't very often meow to each other. And so the fact that they meow to us to communicate seems to be a trick that they've picked up during domestication, to specifically to communicate with humans. Now that might make you think, well, maybe cats are the only species of feline that meows. Maybe the, the meow itself evolved just a few thousand years ago. Well, we can test that idea by going to YouTube. This, for example, is a bobcat. And that is a meow. It's a little bit deeper because it's a bigger cat, but it is essentially a meow. Or this is a lovely species called a serval. All right, that's clearly a meow. In fact, it turns out that all small species of cats meow. Um, and so the domestic cat didn't invent the meow. It just started using it to communicate with, a, with us. And so that leads to some further questions. Um, has the domestic cat, cat's meow changed from that of its ancestor? Have they altered their meow in some way to communicate better with us? And moreover, is variation in the meows that cats utter, is there some some meaning to different meows. Well, this, uh, this, qu these questions have been investigated by a researcher named Nicholas Nicastro, who was a graduate student at Cornell University. And I think this picture, he sent me that picture, and I think that tells you what kind of person he is. Uh, he's a quite an interesting individual. He now writes historical novels. Um, but he did some great research on cats. And one of the things I have to say that was most fun about doing the research for, the, for my book was interacting with the researchers themselves and getting them to tell me their stories, you know, how the projects went, the, the dark underside that doesn't get into papers, and how they became cat scientists in the first place. 
In fact, it turns out that no one sets out to be a cat scientist. It's just through some fluky events that they end up doing what they end up, what they end up studying. In any case, Nicastro did a study on cat's meows. And the first question was, has the cat's meow evolved from its ancestor? Well, this is the ancestor of the domestic cat. It's a species called the African wild cat. I'll tell you more in a little bit about how we know that's the ancestor. Take, it, take my word for it now. As you can see, this is a cat that looks pretty much like a domestic cat. I like to say that if you saw one walking through your backyard, uh, your first thought would not, be, would, be, would not be, what's an African wild cat doing in Clayton, but what a cool looking cat. I've never seen one quite like it. And truly, they are very similar to domestic cats. There are almost no differences, very few differences. So in any case, Nicastro went to South Africa to the Pretoria Zoo where they breed African wildcats. And he took his uh, recording devices and he simply me uh, recorded cats meowing, African wildcats. And then he analyzed those meows and compared them to the meows of the domestic cat. And what he found is that there is a difference, that house cat meows are higher pitched and shorter in duration. The wildcat calls, uh, when people listen to them, he, he played back the recordings to you know, people who put on headphones and listen to them, the wildcat calls were, came across as more urgent and de demanding, kind of meow, whereas the domestic cats were a more pleasing meow. So, and people rated them as much nicer. And so what that suggests is that the house cat has actually altered its meow. It has evolved during domestication to make a sound that is more pleasing to us, that in some way puts us, if you will, in a better mood. In fact, he suggested that children have high-pitched uh, have high-pitched voices and that perhaps we prefer higher pitched sounds for that reason. Maybe that's true, maybe not, but it's certainly the evidence shows that the meow has changed in a way that is attractive to us. Well, the next question is, is the variation in the meow meaningful? There's the question. And if you've lived with a cat, you've probably noticed that your cat has different meows that it uses in different contexts. And is there some meaning to these different meows? Is it trying to tell us something different? Or more generally, is there a cat language that we just need to decipher where this sound means I'm hungry and this sound means um, I want to be petted and so on? Well, Nicastro tested this idea by going to people's houses and for each cat in that house, recording its meows in five different contexts. When the cat was just content, being stroked and in a good mood, when the cat was confined to a space that it did not want to be in, usually in a door with the door closed, when the cat was about to be fed, when it was in, in an unfamiliar space, which was Nicastro's car, and finally when it was being aggravated by being brushed backwards. So for each cat, he recorded meows in the five different contexts, and then he analyzed those meows, and he found two things. First is there is no uniform cat language. Although each cat would have different meows in different contexts, there was no generality. The meow that a, one cat would make when it was about to be fed would be different from the meow that another cat would make. And so there is no universal cat language. Moreover, he asked the people in his study, who were mostly college undergraduates, to see if they could guess what context each meow was given in. So they were given, they listened to a call, they said, here are your five choices, which one is it? And they would say which one they thought. And people basically were no better than guessing. And so the bottom line is, there is no general cat language that, that they are using to communicate with us, which is a little confusing because they seem to be doing it for a reason. Well, the explanation was revealed by this woman here, uh, Sarah Brown, who is a cat, uh, 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 sorry, Sarah Ellis, who is a cat researcher and one of the noted, most noted cat researchers in England. And she did the same experiment with one twist. When she played the recordings to people, she included, again, a bunch of undergraduates and other people, but she also included the person who lived with the cat. And even though the other people couldn't tell you the context, the person who lived with the cat was really quite good at it. That most times that person could correctly say, oh, oh, Leo is very happy right now, or Chester wants to be fed, or whatever. They were very good at picking the context. And so what seems to happen is that cats and the people they live with negotiate their private language where they get between the two of them to understand that when the cat makes this sound, it means this. When the cat makes that sound, it means something else. And so cats have evolved this capacity 
but they do it in a very uh, specific way. And how that actually happens remains to be determined. So that's the, the cat's meow. But there is another signature sound that cats make, and that, of course, is purring. And again, we might ask, are domestic cats the only felines that purr? And again, the answer is no. This is a serval, and that very clearly is the same sound our domestic cats make. And in fact, again, all small felines can purr. Now, the larger species, the lions and tigers, don't because they have a different throat structure that allows them to roar. But all small felines purr. Uh, purr. And it turns out that, again, people who live with cats probably know, they have different purrs. One is the very content sound, like this one here. You have a cat on your lap, you're stroking her, and she makes a very pleasant thrumming sound. But there's another sound they make, and that's when they want something, or they're excited. And again, if you've had a cat, and picture yourself in the kitchen opening a can of wet food, and your cat is winding between your legs and rubbing up against you and purring in a very loud, demanding way, kind of a boom, boom, a chainsaw kind of sound. <laughs> and so they do make these different purrs. And a, another British behaviorist, Karen McComb, decided to study these different purrs to try to understand uh, what's going on with them. And so she recorded cats in two contexts. The first was a, a happy cat, a cat being stroked that was purring very calmly. And here is the contentment purr. And that's a, such a warm, heartwarming sound. But then there's a second purr call, called the solicitation purr, when they want something. And to get the cats to give this purr, um, McComb had a, had a brilliant strategy. She found people who fed their cats first thing in the morning. Now, that is a really bad idea. Um, so she told these people, when your alarm clock goes off, don't do what you normally do, get up and feed the cat, just stay in bed. And so they did that, and sure enough, within three minutes, the cat would jump up on the bed, walk up to the person's head right next to their ears, and start purring in this very loud way. And she had a recorder, the recorder was set up to, re to record it. So here is what's called the solicitation purr. Louder, more insistent, demanding. So those are the, are the, the different purrs. And so then McComb used uh, modern digital techniques to look at the spectrum of sound on the computer, and she was able to isolate the difference between the two purrs. And it's that one peak up here at the short uh, the low frequencies that is the biggest difference between the solicitation purr and the contentment purr. Now, I should tell you, by the way, she played these purrs to people, and they asked them, which do you like more? And far and away, they liked the contentment purr more. Uh, so then she took the solicitation purr, and she digitally changed it by removing that one peak. And sure enough, people liked that more. So that one peak is really what gets, gets your attention. So this, I thought, was a great study. She showed what the difference in these two purrs and, and how they use this one that really gets our attention. Uh, but then she had this explanation. And her explanation was this. Her, she said that sounds of this frequency are the same frequency that human babies crying make. And she said her argument was that humans, as you may know, are innately attuned to the sound of a baby crying. That gets our attention really very effectively. And so her argument was that cats had evolved to basically exploit our sensory system to use the sound that gets our attention to purr when they want our attention. This to me sounded ridiculous. I mean, it's a nice study, but this seemed like going too far. So, but then I, I decided, well, let me listen for myself. She made her audio files available online. And so listen to the solicitation purr again and see if you hear a baby crying. Who hears a baby crying? Yeah, generally when I play this, about half the people do, half the people don't. Well, you can decide for yourself whether this is a reasonable explanation. There are, if you go to YouTube and just Google something like solicitation purr or maybe cat purr, you can find these calls yourself, it's purrs and decide for yourself. So it seems that the cat meowing and purring has evolved during domestication. As I showed you with the picture of the African wildcat, anatomically, the domestic cat has changed very little. In fact, there are very few ways 
that the domestic cat, all domestic cats have differ, differ from their ancestor, the wild cat. Um, are there any other behaviors that are evolutionary changes? And so I thought, what other behaviors that house cats do seem like they might be different from their ancestors? And I came up with a list of them. Sitting in boxes, <laughs> chasing laser pointers, responding to catnip, uh, what's called kneading or making biscuits, bringing toys for play. And these seem like things that wild cats would not do. And so the question is, do wild felines do any of them? Let's start with sitting in boxes. <laughs> yep. Turns out that many species of felines, you put a box, they're in it. What about chasing laser pointer dots? There's lots of videos online. Here's a tiger. And a little slower than your house cat, but the same thing. And many other species will do this as well. Um, do they like catnip? Absolutely. Now, so th none of these traits, in other words, are traits that evolved during domestication. What about what is called making biscuits? This is where an, a cat will, will be either on your belly or on a blanket, will seem to get into a trance, and will start going back like this, sometimes for minutes on end, and then finally will we'll settle down and curl up and go to sleep. And it's really adorable, except that their claws come out when they do that. So some, if it's on your belly, it's fun and, and pain at the same time. Um, <laughs> So this behavior of kneading is something that kittens and cubs of all feline species do when they're nursing. They do this to their mother's belly. It's thought to be a way of stimulating milk flow when they're nursing. And what has happened with the domestic cat is that this behavior has just been retained into adulthood. Now, as, th as far as we know, the domestic cat is the only cat that will do that as an adult, although it has not been studied all that much. But there are no confirmed reports in other species. So this might be one trait that has evolved during domestication, a way in which perhaps adult cats bond with humans by going through this behavior. And so there's one behavioral difference. Uh, another one is bringing toys to play with. Now this is a video of uh, my cat Nelson. And he has just brought this, and he's bringing it up to me, and drops the toy, and says, oh, there it is. It's playtime. <laughs> and he just started doing that entirely on his own. And then sometimes if I would pick up the toy and throw it, he would run and get it and bring it back. He was fetching. Again, he had not been trained. He did this. He developed this on his own. Well, when this first happened, I thought that Nelson was the most marvelous cat in the world. <laughs> And he is the most marvelous cat in the world, but not for this reason. Um, because I did a little research, and it turns out that this is well known in cats, that some scientists have actually studied this, and about one cat in five will do this. And so cats just do this on their own. Now, again, this doesn't seem like the sort of behavior that lions and ocelots and wild species would do. I mean, it's hard to know since they don't live in our houses. But this seems like a behavior, again, that might have evolved during domestication. So between bringing toys, making biscuits, purring and meowing differently, there are a few behavioral candidates for traits that have evolved during domestication. And there's one more that definitely has evolved. And that has to do with their tails. And in particular, it's this behavior here, sticking their tail up in the air. This is a, something that cats will do when they're approaching another cat or a person and it is a sign of friendliness, it's saying, I come in peace, I want to be your friend. And so just to illustrate this, this is another of my cats, this is Archie. I'm calling him. And there it goes. And, and then he rubs it against my leg, and it's a very stereotype behavior that cats do. And so presumably it's, it's to indicate friendly intentions. Well, some scientists decided to test, is this really what, what that signal means? And they took advantage of uh, something that I was unaware of, and that is that if you bring a cat into a room and put a silhouette of a cat cut out against the wall, the cat will initially react as if it's another cat. Now, very quickly, they, they figure out the roost, but initially, they'll react to the, the cutout as if it were a live cat. And so what the researchers did is they put silhouettes of a cat with its tail up or with its tail down and introduced cats to see how they responded. 
And when the tail was up, the cat in the room would lift its own tail up and approach relatively quickly. On the other hand, when the tail was down, the focal cat did not raise its tail very much and was much slower to approach, it, to approach the cutout and also often wiggled its tail back and forth, which as you may know is a sign of nervousness and, and wor being worried. And so it, clearly se it seems clearly that the t tail up sign is a sign of friendliness from one cat to another. And it makes sense in a way to use, uh, well, let me come back to why they use the tail. Now, it turns out that African wildcats do not do this behavior. And in fact, there is only a, one other cat species in the world that does this. Anyone want to guess what, what species that is? It won't be on the final. <laughs> not, a, not a cheetah, not a puma. Oh, we're getting so close, but no one know. Not a leopard. Lion, yes. Lions also use this sign that when lions are approaching each other, they'll do the same uh, tail up in the air. Now, why do they do that? One thing about lions, as you probably know, is that they live, they are the only wildcat species that lives in social groups. All other species are, for the most part, loners that live by themselves, except for mother cats when they're raising their young. But lions live in prides, and prides are composed of related females. That is, a, a mother and her daughters, or their cousins, but they're all related individuals, females. The males, when they grow up, they leave and go up to another pride. But the females are, are all related to each other. And pride members, you've undoubtedly seen the documentaries there, they are friendly to each other, they rub up against each other, they play, they groom. Females will even nurse each other's young. So they're, they're very social cats. And you think about it, when you're living with lots of other lions and you're bumping into them all the time, it's good to have a signal just to let some, another lion know, hey, I'm here to be friends. And what better organ to do that than the tail? I mean, you can't use your arms because you're walking on them. You could use your ears and your whiskers, but they can't be seen at a distance. The tail is the per perfect signal. So it makes sense that lions use the tail to communicate. And the question then is, why do domestic cats, why have it, this is a phenomenon called convergent evolution, where species evolve the same trait. Why have domestic cats done this? Because as you probably are aware, cats are, domestic cats are thought to be aloof loners as well. Well, it turns out that's not correct. That in some places, unknown outdoor cats occur at very high densities. They can find big colonies of cats. And usually that occurs in places where there is a lot of food. And that might be, for example, places where people feed them. There are many places in every city, St. Louis, there are plenty of them, where kind-hearted individuals go out and feed the unowned stray cats. And when you have a lot of food, you end up with a lot of cats. It also occurs in fishing villages where there's a lot of uh, the, the, the fish scraps get thrown into piles or farms, there's often a lot of food around. In all those places, you get big colonies of cats. And it turns out that in those places, those colonies form into social groups that are very similar to lion prides. These are groups composed of related females that stay together from one generation to the next. And these females are very friendly to each other. They lie next to each other. They groom. They play with each other. Females nurse each other's kittens. Females will even serve as midwives when another female is giving birth. So these are social groups that really, really are, should be called prides. They really are very similar to lion prides, that they have evolved this independently. And the reason is all this food, just like lions live on the African plains where there's lots of food, domestic cats take advantage of that as well. And so that's why cats have convergently evolved the signal of the tail up. Now there is one way in which domestic cats and lions differ to a large extent, and that is lions are famous as hunting, for hunting in groups and bringing down large prey. Um, fortunately, domestic cats do not do this. I mean, <laughs> imagine a pride of cats taking down a groundhog or a raccoon. It could be very scary. All right, so that um, concludes the first half of my talk. Now let's talk about the, the, the past, present, and future of cats. Where they came from, what's happening today, what the future may hold. This is the first cat, or a reconstruction of it. It's a species called Proilurus lemonensis. It occurred 30 million years ago. And based on its skeleton, it was a cat. That if we saw one walking down the street, it would be a slightly oddly proportioned cat. And this is actually the hallmark 
of the entire family of cats, the Felidae, for the most part, a cat is a cat. Yes, they differ in size and color and maybe how long their legs are, but they're all very similar to each other. There's not a, they're very homogenous overall. Well, for 10 million years, as far as we know, Proailurus was the only cat type of cat around. And then, 20 million years ago, the cat world split into two lineages. Uh, one of those lineages were these saber-toothed cats. You're probably familiar with them from the Flintstones or Ice Age or other, uh, other movies or TV shows. Saber-toothed cats were real, and they evolved 20 million years ago. This is the saber-toothed cat from South America that lived relatively recently. It was the largest cat ever known. It weighed close to half a ton, so bigger than a Siberian tiger, just a, a very big animal. In North America, our saber-toothed cat was only slightly smaller, and unknown, most people don't know this, but saber-toothed cats were around until about 10,000 years ago. In other words, the first humans to arrive in North America interacted with these cats. And then they went extinct all around the world, probably because we killed off the large animals that they preyed upon. But they, they were around recently. There are fossils of saber-toothed cats from Missouri. This, in, incidentally, is the La Brea tar pits uh, in Los Angeles, where they occurred 10,000 years ago. Well, as I said, there were two, uh, two groups of cats, the saber-toothed cats and the other cats, or sometimes called the conical-toothed cats. All of today's cats are in that other group. And it does uh, make you think, as I said, the saber-toothed cats all went extinct, but what if it had gone the other way? You know, what if instead of the saber-toothed cats, the other lineage had gone or extinct and we still had saber-toothed cats today? Well, I would like to think that we would have saber-toothed house cats. <laughs> I think it's a wonderful idea. I'm disappointed that no one has developed such a breed yet, but maybe someday. In any case, let's talk about the modern cats. When we sequence their DNA, we can get an estimate of how long ago they evolved. And this analysis suggests that the ancestor of all of today's felines, all 42 species, occurred about 11 million years ago. And then they started diversifying into today's cats. And so we might ask, I've already told you the answer, but pretend I haven't. We might ask, which of these 42 species is the ancestor of, of the domestic cat? Now, everyone is familiar with the big cats, lions, tigers, leopards, cheetahs, and so on, but there are only about nine species of them. The other 33 or so species are small cats, and you've probably heard of an ocelot or a bobcat. Um, has anyone heard of other types of small cats? The lynx, the lynx yes, that's a, yes. Uh, that's not a cat. The civet is called the civet cat, but it's actually not a cat. Sand cat, now I'm counting the clouded leopard as a large cat, although it's, it's a small large cat. Caracal, very, all right, we're getting into some of the obscure ones. The point is, there are 33 small cats, and most people have never heard of the great majority of them. For example, the Ancilla, the marbled cat, the Andean cat, the flat-headed cat, the jungle cat, the rusty-spotted cat, you've probably never heard of any of these, or the black-footed cat, or I could go on and on. Turns out there are lots of small species of cats in Africa, Asia, in South America, primarily. And in theory, any one of those could be the ancestor of the domestic cat. But in fact, uh, it is the wild cat. And what people long suspected that because wild cats, I mean, look at this cat. This is the European wild cat. It looks just like a cat in your backyard. Um, and so they look very similar. And so it's long been presumed that the wild cat is the ancestor. And in fact, the DNA confirms that. But if we look at this part of the evolutionary tree, you can see the domestic cat and the wild cat are the closest relatives. They're only slightly different. So the domestic cat did evolve from the wild cat, but that doesn't solve our problem entirely because there are multiple types of wild cat. And when I use the term wild cat, I am re referring specifically to a species called the wild cat. It's not a wild cat. It is a species, the wild cat. And there are three different types. And where did, which of these did the domestic cat evolve from? Well, that question was tackled by a graduate student at Oxford named Carlos Driscoll, who traveled all over the world to get samples of domestic cats all over the world and also the wild cats. This particular picture is he's wearing a coat made by Kazakh eagle hunters in far western Mongolia, which is a, 
And they used golden eagles to catch cats and foxes, which sounds mean, but you know, that's, that's what they have to do to live in their environment. This is a coat made out of 40 wild, Asian wildcats, which are very hard to come by. And he was able to get DNA samples from each one of those skins, which was a great uh, boon to his study. And so doing that, he was able to get samples of all the wildcats and come up with the evolutionary tree of wildcats. And this analysis found some surprising results. First, it turns out that the African wildcat is two different types, the South African wildcat and the North African wildcat, and they are quite distinct genetically, suggesting they've been separated for several hundred thousand years. So people have never suspected that they were two di different types of African wildcats. Also, this animal here, the Chinese mountain cat, beautiful looking animal from the Himalaya Himalayas and nearby regions, has long been suspected to be similar to a wildcat, but the evolutionary tree says it is a wild cat. It's, the Asian wild cat is more closely related to the Chinese mountain cat than to other types of wild cats. So here are the five types of wild cats, their geographic distribution. And then the question, where did the domestic cat originate? And there's a number of possibilities. Maybe it, it originated in Europe, maybe in North Africa, maybe the domestic cat was uh, domesticated everywhere. That's actually happened in many species. Dogs, for example, were domesticated from wolves probably at least twice. It's also true of pigs and other domesticated species. So maybe the cat was domesticated multiple times. Well, Driscoll's DNA analysis clearly showed the answer, and that is the domestic cat is descended from the North African wild cat. In fact, their DNA is barely different. So that clearly is the source of the uh, domestic cat. And that makes a lot of sense because the blue color, is the light blue, is where the North African wildcat is from. It actually gets into Asia, as you can see. Um, and including this area here, which is sometimes called the Fertile Crescent, part of what we now call the Middle East. And this is where human civilization first began, when people gave up a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, they settled down, formed villages, and agriculture began. And you know what happens when you raise crops. You, during the good season, you try to grow as much food as possible and store it away in wherever, in granaries, for leaner times. Granaries such as that. And when you have a big pile of, of food sitting there, you know what that does as well. It attracts rodents. And when you're attracting rodents, then you attract African wildcats. And so the idea of how domestication occurred is that there were some African wildcats that were particularly bold, willing to walk into a village and to take advantage of all the food there, even though there are people around. And so those bold cats had more kittens because they had more food. And so the genes that made them bolder were passed on to the next generation. In turn, the people there may have seen the cats and seen the benefit to them, and so they treated them nicely, maybe putting out some food for them to eat, maybe letting them into the warm, dry huts to, in, in bad times. And again, the boldest cats that took advantage of that did the best, and those genes evolved. And eventually, there was this back and forth, and voila, we have the domestic cat. That is the standard scenario of how domestication occurred, and it makes sense. There's actually a similar idea about how dogs were domesticated. Well, assuming that's the case, the next question is, where exactly did domestication occur? One idea is that it occurred in Egypt, and that's because we have tomb paintings from about 3,500 years ago showing a cat eating underneath a table, uh, a cat with a collar, a cat sitting under uh, the mistress of the house's chair, very clearly indicating that by 3,500 years ago, cats in Egypt were domesticated. But there's another idea, and that is that domestication occurred in Turkey. And the reason for this idea, there's several reasons. One is that people in Turkey today love cats, that Istanbul is sometimes called Katstanbul. And you may have seen the movie Keddy about Turkish cats in Istanbul, which is a lovely movie. Uh, but there is also some scientific evidence that suggests that Turkey or nearby, maybe when domestication occurs, it actually comes from the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean. And it is the first archeological evidence of a cat-human association. This is a grave site from about 9,500 years ago. It has a 30-year-old human that was buried with treasured objects, such as polished stone, axes, ochre, flint tools, and other things. Um, and at the foot of the human, you can't really see what's there, but the drawing shows you, is an eight-month-old cat in its own shallow grave. 
and this cat was very carefully laid down and covered, so it was intentionally buried. And this suggests that this too was a treasured item, and that this was a, an association that this was a pet cat. Now, some people have suggested that this indicates that domestication of cats was occurring 9,500 9, uh, years ago. The problem with this interpretation is that you can't tell from the skeleton whether that's an African wild cat or a domestic cat, because their skeletons are basically the same. And it is well known that many feline species, if you take a kitten or a cub and raise it gently, it will be a, a tame animal, such as this cheetah or many other species of felines. And so a tame animal is not a domesticated one. Domesticated ones have had genetic changes. They have evolved. A tame animal is just a wild animal that you've treated nicely and so it will hang out with you and, and not be too bad. Um, so for example, a tame wolf, you can tame a wolf. I don't recommend it, but you can tame a wolf, but a tame wolf is not a dog. Dogs are very different from wolves. And so we don't know whether that skeleton was just an African wildcat that had been raised from a kitten or was the beginning of domestication. Maybe. Domestication goes back 9,000 years, but certainly by 3,500 years ago in Egypt, domestication had occurred. Where and when precisely is still unknown. What about the history since then? Well, the archaeological record tells us how cats then spread through the world. From, from the Mediterranean, probably from Egypt, they hopped onto boats, stowed away, and got to Greece, certainly by 1700 BC. Then they spread to Rome. Then from the Roman Empire, they spread out through the, rest of, through the rest of Europe. And so that is record the archaeology tells us uh, pretty clearly. However, there's a fascinating study recently published by this man, Claudio Ottoni, who is now a postdoctoral fellow in Belgium, who decided to look at the DNA of, of cats from archaeological remains to try to trace their movements following the, their genetics. So we got all of these bones of cats from archaeological deposits, sequenced their DNA to see if there was a, he, he could deduce where they, how they travel. And so to do this, you can see he got uh, cats from 31 different sites in Africa, Europe, and Western Asia. And these sites were, just look at the age, some of them were quite old to relatively recently. In some, he was able to get DNA from 352 specimens and was able to deduce much of the history of cats. And for the most part, uh, oh, I should say among these specimens, my favorite were cat mummies. It turns out that the Egyptians mummified cats by the millions, which is kind of odd because they revered cats and yet they made mummies out of them. We could talk about that later if you want, but the fact is we now have them in natural history museums. And so Tony got a DNA from these specimens as well as many others. And what he found is for the most part, the standard story of the spread of cats to Greece, to Rome, and then from the Roman Empire north, seems to make sense. Um, but there was one interesting finding. But before telling you about that interesting finding, when his paper was published, it went viral. It was everywhere on the internet and, and media. And if you had asked me what aspect of the study would go viral, I would say, well, cat mummies, they're really cool. I mean, look at those, and there's great stories behind it. But that wasn't it. Instead, it was this, Viking cats. <laughs> Memes like this popped up everywhere. <laughs> and the reason for that is this, that uh, Otoni, one of his archaeological sites was the town of Ralswick in what is now northern Germany, a site from 700 AD where there were cat remains. And it was a Viking village and seaport. And so he sequenced the DNA from the cats found there. And what that DNA, it was not most similar to the ones that were marching up through Europe. It was most similar to the Egyptian cats that from, from down in Egypt. And so what this suggested was that they had gotten to northern Europe, not from spreading, continued spreading, but from the uh, Vikings taking a longboat down to Egypt, and probably not to pick up cats, but when the, when the boat was there, the cats jumped on board, and they brought them up, and that's how they colonized Europe, and perhaps from there to Iceland and Greenland, perhaps even North America. So that was the one unexpected finding from the study of ancient DNA. Um, we also know about the expansion of, uh, into Asia. They went from seaports in the, in, the, in the Gulf there to India. They also came across the Silk Road, getting to Pakistan, then India, China, and Japan, and so on. And so that's how 
cats spread to the world, and of course from Great Britain they came to North America and Australia and so on. Finally, in the last few minutes, I want to talk about the future of cats in a couple of different ways. And the first is people are looking at the genome of cats. You're probably aware of people looking at the genome of humans, which has been so useful for us in understanding our medical issues as well as the history of humans and so on. Well, people are looking at cat genomes as well. And I'm proud to say that this work actually originated right here at Washington University. The first cat genome to be sequenced was in 2014, and the project was led by researchers at, at the medical school here. Now, since then, the center of cat genome sequencing has actually moved down the road, and it's now at Mizzou, the University of Missouri, where they have the 99 Cat Genome Sequencing Initiative. It is led by the world's preeminent cat geneticist, the aptly named Leslie Lyons. <laughs> and they are sequencing the genomes of many different cats, and they're doing this for a number of reasons, but one of them is to understand genetic disorders in cats, just like we're sequencing the human genome uh, to understand our disorders, they're doing that for cats. And let me give you, it's been remarkably successful, and let me give you one example. There's a disease called polycystic kidney disease, which causes uh, cysts to form in the kidney, these big cysts that eventually can be fatal. In fact, this is a trait that is also occurs in humans. Now, originally, poly, uh, PKD, as it's called, occurred in 38% of Persian cats. At that time, the Persian cat was the most popular cat in the world, and so this made the PKD the most important cat disease that we were aware of. Well, Lyons and her team identified the mutation causing PKD, and, uh, and, the, and the importance of this cannot be underestimated, because once you could detect whether a cat was a carrier for that gene, you could do two things, that mutation. You could screen all these cats, and if your cat had that mutation, you could start treating the cat prophylactic, prophylactically even before the disease manifest itself, and so to help the cat uh, before the, the disease occurred. More importantly, breeders stopped breeding those cats, and the frequency of the allele of the mutation plummeted, so it's now less than 10%. So a clear example of, um, of the usefulness of this approach. It also has benefits to humans because, as I said, we get the very same disease, and so breakthroughs in understanding the disease in cats and the genetics has been transferred to understanding human, the human condition as well. This is actually true of a number of, of diseases because it, the cat genome and the human genome actually share a lot of similarities, more so than, say, mouse genomes or the dog or so on. And so understanding the cat genome turns out to be very useful. Just one other example, this is a new breed of cat called the munchkin. It is the corgi of cats, and uh, it's actually a very healthy cat. It is not a problem for these cats. As you can see, if you don't look at the legs, it's a normal-looking cat, but it has these short legs. This is a mutation causes it. It's the same mutation that causes short-leggedness in humans, and this mu the mutation for that has been discovered as well, and they have applications for human health also. Because of the work of Lyons and others, we now have all of these uh, commercial products that have been developed where you can test your cat to to see if it has a battery of genetic diseases. And it's important to realize that these commercial products, which are now quite successful, all stem from the basic research done by Lyons and her colleagues. Finally, I'd like to talk just about the further future of cats, in particular the question, are cats evolving? There are now populations of feral cats living out in the wild on every continent uh, except Australia, some estimates of as many as 300 million of them. And these cats occupy very different environments, from the blazing hot deserts of the center of Australia to the high mountains, the high cold mountains of Tasmania and, and New Zealand. One thing we've learned in recent years that Darwin was wrong about is that when the environment changes, species can adapt very rapidly. In those circumstances, natural selection pressures can be strong, and that leads to a rapid evolutionary response. And so it's reasonable to suggest, to suspect, that these cats are actually adapting to their different envir environments. Surprisingly, no one has studied this. Now, as I told you earlier, as I did my research for this book, I became interested in, cat, in doing some cat science myself. And one of the hallmarks of my research career has been studying how lizards adapt rapidly when they're exposed to new conditions. 
And so that got me thinking, maybe I could study cats. Maybe they're adapting and adapting in different ways. But how to do that? Um, and then it occurred to me that there's one trait that would be the best one to look at at first, and that is their coloration. This is an animal that's a black leopard, often called a black panther. You probably think of a leopard as having spots, but in fact, in many places, leopards are black. And usually those places are in forests where it's dark. And the idea is that black coloration gives them greater camouflage when there's dim light. In fact, there are 14 species of cats in which black individuals occur. They're called melanistic. And almost all of the species occur in forests. And so this suggests that that is the cause. Uh, that, that, that it's an adaptation to living in dark environments. And so the idea is, well, maybe there are some feral cat populations living in forests. Maybe they're evolving to become darker. In fact, there's a little bit of evidence for this. A little-known cat from Madagascar called the Fidoati, uh, when it was first discovered, scientists thought it was a different species. But it's just a feral cat. The DNA demonstrated that. And it lives in the forest. So this seemed like an opportunity. Can we see whether cat populations are evolving different colors in different environments? Well, I was very fortunate to get a grant from our wonderful McDonald International Scholars Academy, which, as you probably know, is a network of 34 leading uh, universities around the world with Washington University at the center of this network. And so they provided a seed grant for me to work with colleagues at two of the partner institutions in the academy, the University of Queensland and the University of Melbourne. And what we did was we studied the color of cats in Australia. And we took advantage of the fact that cats, are, that wildlife is being monitored intensively in Australia using trail cameras, which take a picture of anything that moves in front of them. And so there's a huge repository of photographs of cats and other wildlife. And so we were able to get hold of these images, and we collected data from 18 different sites looked at more than 4,000 images of cats. And I have to be honest when I say we, I mean Hugh McGregor, one of our colleagues. <laughs> and we scored the color and the patterns of the cats in different places. So here are some of the images. You can see they're striped or spotted. There's kittens, a more spotted one, a, a swirly pattern, some orange cats that blend in very well in the red deserts of Australia. There's a black cat. And so here's the results. In fact, just as we predicted, the proportion of black cats is the greatest in dense forest, whereas in the open deserts, there are very few black cats. So very clearly, the cats in different environments are evolving different colors. So this is very exciting. It indicates that they are di diverging evolutionarily, and so it makes it reasonable to look at more complicated traits, such as the physiology allowing them to, oh, I forgot to show you. Look how the orange cat blends in, or the spots in an open grassy area. These are some taxidermy cats, but you see in a forest, the orange one stands out much more than the black one. It really does make sense that they're blending in. So we're going to, now we're going to expand our study to look at physiological traits. Are they adapting to being in areas where water is scarce or in where it's very cold and so on? So that's the cat project, or one cat project, that we're just getting underway. Lastly, let's talk about the deep future of cats. Eventually, humans will stop destroying the environment. We have to hope. It will happen eventually. There are many cats, many species of all kinds that we hope will survive, but will there be tigers and ocelots? Who knows? One species that will be around for sure, though, is the domestic cat. There are an estimated one billion cats in the world. Several hundred million of them at least occur as feral cats. They will be around. And they certainly will be the ancestors of the cats of the future. And I should say, every continent except Antarctica, there are many islands, they're everywhere. And so we should expect, I think, that cats will, well, let me put it this way. Think what happened when a cat invaded South America three million years ago. It gave rise to the eight different small cat species that occurred there today. Or think of Pro Ailurus, which evolved 30 million years ago, and its descendants today. So I think the good news is we will have cats around in the future. They are likely to be descendants of the domestic cat that lives today. So that's my cheery conclusion, hopefully. Um, perhaps more cheery is the four cats I share a house with. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I would be happy to take questions if people have them.
we have two people with microphones and here's I was watching Archie go on the treadmill. How did you get him to do that? Was there some uh, tidbit up above that we couldn't I, see? I wish I could claim credit for that, but we bought the, tre the, the, the circle, the wheel. I was showing that at the very beginning, if you didn't see that. And all four cats ignored it. And we tried to entice them with treats or with toys, and they ignored it. And I thought, well, there's $200 down the drain. Uh, and then a couple weeks later, Archie just started getting on it on his own and running on it. And he does it sometimes clearly to get our attention, but sometimes we hear it when we're nowhere near the, the room where, that, where it is. He just does it, I think, for fun and to get our attention. Why don't we go to this question and that question up there? Thank you. Um, I have not read the book, but I was wondering if you talk at all about the impact of domestic cats on bird populations or like birds from an evolutionary perspective at all? Um, not from an evolutionary perspective. I talk about it a little bit in the book. Initially, I was going to talk about it a lot, but it turns out it's an enormous topic. Um, the issue is that cats are consummate predators, and the fact that there's so little change from their ancestors mean that they're very easy for them to revert to their wild ways. And so there are many unknown cats, as I've pointed out, just living in nature, doing just fine. And then even our pet cats, anyone who, who's had a cat knows, they will go out and bring prey in. And um, the question is what to do about that. And of course, one answer is keep your cat inside. Um, but so there's a lot of controversy. Uh, in some places, such as Australia, the feral cats are a huge problem because there are many species there that have no experience evolutionarily with a predator like a cat, and so they're very vulnerable, and the cats have caused the extinction of many species and many others are threatened. Um, there's also concern, perhaps in North America, that cats are having that effect as well. It's less clear that, that it, they are causing species to be in danger, but many people are concerned. On the other hand, there are many unowned outdoor cats, and there are people who feed them and take care of them. And everyone wishes those cats weren't there, but they are there and people feed them. And there's this big debate between the, the conservationists who say, you do not feed those cats. In fact, we need to round, all, round up all those cats and kill them, essentially, versus the people who want to feed the cats. And it's a very sticky question. So. Um, so I talk about it a little bit in my book, but it was such a big topic, it was just too much. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. Uh, uh, did, have, has anyone, uh, you or anyone that you've uh, encountered, uh, studied why cats especially seem to be so cruel? Why they seem to so be? So cruel. Cruel to their prey. Cruel. Well, you know, well, cruel. That's part of play. Um, it's not appropriate to, to use terms like cruel, or, that's just nature. And you know, why, do they, why do they play with prey? Well, in some cases, it's to train their kittens, but they do it even when kittens aren't around. And it, it's, um, no, people don't really know. They, uh, they, uh, they obviously, if you, your cat in your house with a toy, they love doing that, and probably as part of the instinct to hunt has Given them, given them rewards to chase and to pounce and so on. And so when they catch a prey, it triggers those, those behaviors. But why exactly they do that is not clear. Whoever has the microphone. Um, when you were studying with other researchers and looking at cats meowing and how they communicated with humans, did you see any research about how cats communicated with other animals in the household? Oh, that's like, a, would they meow with dogs or other domesticated pets? That is a fascinating question. And sometimes they will meow at dogs. Um, but I think even more fascinating than that is that there are some signals that dogs and cats use that mean different things. And per think particularly about wagging a tail. A dog wagging its tail is happy, is friendly. A cat tail back and forth is stand back. Uh, <laughs> And yet they figure it out. 
and so they're able to communicate and overcome those differences. Or another thing is that cat behavior, friendly approaching behavior is to touch noses. That's not a dog behavior, but cats and dogs living together will touch their noses. So it is fascinating how they're able to do that. Oh, Professor, uh, uh, thanks so much for your uh, tremendous lecture. Um, just struck by the evolutionary adapt adapt adaptability of, of cats, and I wonder if there are some insights that could be extracted by wildlife conservationists about how to improve the resiliency of vulnerable uh, wildlife species, especially in light of climate change. I don't know what we can infer about how to um, strengthen resilience of vulnerable wildlife species from the evolutionary adaptability of cats? That's an interesting question. Um, one thing is that cats are very versatile. And I think that, and that they're, they're not, they have very good hunting techniques, but they're also very versatile. They're very smart animals. And that probably allows them to cope with many different situations. Um, I'm not sure how useful that is to know, though, because if you're trying to save some species that's, that's dumb, um, <laughs> they can't make them smarter. But it's an interesting idea. I'd, I'd have to think about that some more. And we have one more question. So um, you mentioned that we've seen uh, in feral populations of cats a uh, tendency in wooded areas for them to develop darker um, fur patterns. Is that something you've seen in other types of animals, like dogs or various other creatures? Um, it honestly has not been studied that much. There is an interesting phenomenon in dogs that in many places around the world there are street dogs that are just unknown dogs and they kind of look very similar. They're kind of a mid-sized dog. They're slender with longish legs, kind of a tawny color. And actually people thought that this was convergent evolution, that these dogs had gotten to these places and and had been breed dogs and then had all converged on this appearance. But people have done DNA studies and it turns out that all of those dogs, the street dogs around the world represent the early dog condition. They're not descendants of dogs that have been in breeds. They're more like what dogs were like uh, before. And so they're not convergent. They all have the ancestral condition. Um, so that's different than the cat story. And I, I'm unaware of anyone who's who's documented the same sort of phenomenon, but it really hasn't been looked at. I will say this though, pigs, uh, you know, pigs, big pink things with spots, they're now feral in many places and they revert to looking very much like boars. Um, so it's again, not quite the same thing. There's a lot of interesting, it's unfortunate that our domestic animals are getting back into nature and, and living there, but there's interesting evolutionary questions that are only just now being investigated. Well, I'm sorry we're out of time, but I will be around and happy to, to answer questions in the reception. But first, I want to thank everyone for joining me here today, both in person and, and virtually. And I want to thank Dean Hu and the Washington University Alumni Association for including me in this very exciting series celebrating the power of arts and sciences. I want to just reiterate what Dean Hu said, that we have two spectacular uh, events coming up in March, here the, and here they are, and uh, they are going to be wonderful, I'm sure. And finally, uh, for those of you who are here, you're welcome to join us just up the stairs and to the right in the Retner Gallery for a reception, or those of you up front, you can go out this door and take the elevator up there. So thank you very much again. <laughs>